Good morning, New York. Good afternoon, Tallinn. Good afternoon, Midnight Canberra. Greetings to all our friends joining us from three continents. We have here four distinguished speakers on our program, a couple more in addition to the program, and some in the audience are no less distinguished, but I'll acknowledge them right after the main speakers. Our American Russian Speaking Association for Civil and Human Rights is a nearly 10 year old network of exiles and other new Americans from several former Soviet countries. This is our 10th international roundtable in a year, but unlike the previous one, it is part of a large program of civil society discussions organized like ours on a short notice in support of the Summit for Democracy initiated by President Biden. There are dozens of very worthwhile events around it and I encourage you to check them on the website summitfordemocracy.org. The backdrop behind me reminds of our organization's core concern, the rising number of political prisoners in our old countries, as well as our concern for their defenders. Vyasna and Memorial are the leading human rights watchdogs in Belarus and Russia respectively. Vyasna was deprived of its legal status 18 years ago and a similar case by the Kremlin to ban Memorial specifically for its work on political prisoners is currently in court. With your support, we'd like to call the summit's attention to their heroic struggle, not just for their own, but ultimately for our rights and freedoms here in the West. We also urge the participants of the summit to take action toward the release of political prisoners worldwide. Such an effort would be especially timely in the year of the centenary of Andrei Sakhar, who was calling for a global political amnesty, the campaign from which Amnesty International was also born 60 years ago. Now, our response to this summit follows upon our prior successful dialogue with the U.S. government, starting in the first months of our existence with our public awareness campaign on the Sergei Magnitsky Act and House testimony in advance of its passage. Later in the Obama-Biden administration, we had the honor of taking part in the White House annual discussions with dozens of ethnic communities. For our group, this became possible thanks to the enlargement of the tent of American democracy toward marginalized communities that was going on at the time. In my experience, the stand of ethnic inclusion at the Obama-Biden White House was more open to a wider range of accents and had more substance to it than at other levels of government and society that our organization has dealt with. Regrettably, it was all reversed with the overall backsliding of democracy under the next administration and it's quite an effort to rebuild it all over again. Nevertheless, in the past weeks, the State Department and USAID did an extensive work of bringing together dozens of NGOs, large and small, into working groups around this summit, with much openness beyond the so-called establishment, which is one more reason for organizations' leadership support for this summit, regardless of their attacks against its very idea from the quarters associated with mighty interests favoring same old real politique, and at the same time attacks from those who think that it somehow is progressive to ignore labor camps because allegedly this would help strike deals with, with autocracies on other issues. And that's why our association joined the Working Group on Human Rights and its steering committee. Now, as stated by the White House, I'll quote, the summit will showcase one of democracy's unique strengths, the ability to acknowledge its weaknesses and imperfections and confront them openly and transparently. I quote this because this reflects our system's newly found acceptance of constructive criticism. Back when I moved to the US around the turn of the century and when I became a US citizen, uh, quite a few topics were un unwelcome and frowned upon. As for example, the foreign policy influence of corporate interests invested in autocratic regimes or the exclusion of these countries exiles from Western public arenas under the pressure of those profiting from authoritarian capitalism in Russia and other countries. All this was in the range of you cannot say that if you don't want to jeopardize your economic opportunities and acceptance. The Kremlin connected funds were flowing freely through American public institutions and were used to boost some names and silence others. And those venues as have in mind, such critiques, especially by immigrants, are still incompatible with making a career. And yet in our federal government, a fresh air of democratic renewal is blowing and previously marginalized voices seem to count. There are many forces that help bring this about, but I'll mention two as politically and conceptually important. Politically, it has been the massive movement of many races, ethnicities, and faiths for racial justice and equality in America. 
I'm happy I had the privilege to add my two cents to it from my past involvement with the Black Institute, the National Action Network, and others here in New York. Conceptually, today's internal threats to democracies were spelled out by some of the dissident thinkers of the former Soviet bloc, such as Václav Havel, who warned us some 40 years ago when the West was not yet ready to listen. I quote, totalitarian regimes are not merely dangerous neighbors. They are the avant-garde of a global crisis of this civilization, first European, then Euro-American. They are one of the possible futurological studies of the Western world, end of quote. Now, there has been some vigorous debate on whether the summit should prioritize domestic defense and expansion of democracy or countering authoritarianism internationally. But for many of us, one is inseparable from the other. That's why we chose to bring up the topic of political exiles, an often overlooked group of stakeholders in both domestic and international success of this summit. As immigrants with strong opinions, at times too strong for some tastes because of their heightened sensitivity to the erosion of democracy and to corrupt influences from their native countries upon the West, exiles are often a domestic factor in their new countries. Those of them closely connected to democratic and human rights struggles back home may still be an international influence there. And they are a transnational factor too, affecting at least somewhat bilateral relations, even by their presence in a new country, let alone if their old government is bent upon transnational repression, which does not always mean dramatic kidnappings and murders, because in my community, transnational repression has been mostly low key. It relies upon vast Kremlin connected funds invested in Western institutions back when these funds were welcomed and even solicited. The influence they bought has been used for many years to divide the exiles and to misrepresent them to Westerners, making them toxic for donors and employers. Now, how many exiles there are? There can be no precise answer to it as it's not a legal term or a type of visa. And quite often, often political motivation is one of several behind the decision to immigrate. Yet even if we only count those who left their country primarily to escape the consequences of its autocratic system, that still leaves us with many millions of people. And in the past decade, their numbers have swollen from our native countries to be sure, but much more so from the Middle East since the defeat of the Arab Spring and from other regions. We could not bring members of these communities here on such a short notice, but we owe it to them, to mention the millions of Syrian, Egyptian, Venezuelan, Filipino, most recently the new wave of Afghan exiles coming on top of the old waves, one of which was caused by Soviet invasion. Now, what should be their place in the revival of democracies? At the most basic, those who came to the West for the long haul need a voice within their new system. One part of the solution is just better immigrant integration more broadly and extending the right to vote, which also strengthens and expands Western democracy. And some of this is happening before our eyes. Thus, on the day of the summit's opening, New York City Council is expected to grant voting rights in municipal elections to green card and work visa holders. That's a major expansion of democracy after many years of efforts in this direction by dozens of groups, including ours. Across the Atlantic, the new German government program provides for dual citizenship for new non-EU immigrants, which is a big commitment to enlarge the tent of German democracy. But in the US Congress, no such solution will be fast and easy. And besides, representation needs of politically engaged exiles tend to be more specific, to have their opinions at least heard in the foreign policy making toward their old country. That could be a commitment that executive authority can implement on its own. In the words of John Kennedy, foreign policy is too important for all of us to leave it to the experts and the diplomats. The Summit for Democracy is that rare chance to open it up to transnational voices, not just from corporate elites, but also from the middle and lower layers of society. In fact, one such political exile who grew from a humble start into an internationally recognized leader, arguably is the most effective and unifying from our part of the world. And I mean, of course, Svetlana Tsikhanovska. And we learned last week that she will be invited to the summit speaking there, which is hugely positive news, not just for our Belarusian friends, but for many others. As regards the long-term solutions beyond the summit to deepen the integration of exiles in America, this could include setting up country-specific advisory councils at the state's Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, at USAID and other agencies. Perhaps as a next step 
following the working groups created for this summit. Such institutional platforms would harness unique transnational expertise and cross-cultural competency to practical use in public service, while also helping to break some invisible walls and glass ceilings. Besides, it would provide at least some alternative viewpoints to those corporate voices that affect foreign policy daily, not to mention that such higher visibility can help deter transnational repression. Creating such consultative bodies and foreign policy agencies would be a commitment that would deepen our democracy internally and cheer up those fighting against dictatorships. And with that, let me turn to our distinguished speakers whom we are thrilled to have here today. The topic of exiles is universal and potentially boundless, spanning anywhere from Ovid and Dante to the builders of modern democracies, such as Thomas Paine and Victor Hugo, to name just two examples. We will not go that far into the past, but we'll start with some history. And I'm pleased to introduce Elena Gover, adjunct research fellow at the Australian National University in Canberra, where she earned her doctorate in history. Elena was born in Minsk. She has produced many scholarly works, including on Belarusian, Latvian, Jewish, and Russian immigrants in Australia. And at the same time, I want to thank our partners from Svoboda Alliance, a diaspora NGO based in Australia for organizing our event. One of my uh, aspects of my study are uh, immigrants. And the study of immigration has many aspects. One of the most interesting of this to me is immigrant identity. How they see themselves and how others see them. The first features which spring to mind are language, religion, cuisine, sometimes manner of behavior and appearance. And when to the question, where are you originally from? We answer Russian or from Russia or from Belarus. We hear very friendly small talk about vodka, piroshki, and sometimes Putin in a bit of probing way. Certainly, we should see all this as a set of stereotypes, which does not take into consideration the subtle aspects of our real identity. But what is our real identity? And how do we help a stranger to understand it? I began thinking about this many years ago, when I just started studying the story of a Russian family, and I won't talk. Uh, Russian family uh, Illini, who became in, uh, the Illins in Australia. Tracing the descendants of Nikolai, a Russian intellectual and writer, uh, and his son, Leandra, after their immigration to Australia in 1910, I was contacted by an Aboriginal man, Derek, Leandra's great-grandson. It turned out that in spite of the reigning government policy of racial, uh, racial segregation, Leandra married an Aboriginal woman, Kitty, uh, and their descendants were proud to call themselves Aborigines. Derek did not uh, preserve any Russianness, language, religion, customs, and uh, had very vague knowledge of his family's Russian past. But then Derek suddenly said something which I felt has been preserved in their Aboriginal family for generations as a sacred belief. My great granddad Leandro taught his children to be proud. Uh, he told us that all the people, black and white, are equal. He taught us to help the downtrodden and unprivileged and to distinguish between right and wrong. It struck me like uh, a lightning. Uh, that was, uh, this simple philosophy was the essence of the credo of the Russian intelligentsia, or speaking in the modern way, our identity. This was what Chekhov or Tolstoy's heroes would always talk about, but never seem to be able to implement in real life. Becoming acquainted with, Il with the Ilin family, I realized that here we was a rare case where this beautiful Russian credos were tested in the fire and dust of the Australian outback. Uh, 
Uh, after Kitty's death in childbirth in 1925, Leandro raised his family on a cattle uh, station in Australian outback. Witnessing the uh, routine unjust treatment of Aborigines, he became a fighter for their human rights, writing to newspapers and authorities, advising uh, Aborigines on legal matters and helping them in practical ways. Decades later, he was still remembered by local Aborigines as Daddy Ilin. Uh, while his words describing the Aboriginal people as his dark brother gave the title, uh, the, gave my book the title. Uh, starting out in the Russian nobility, they were descending from Rurix, uh, Leander ended his life in Australia as an ordinary laborer. He did not aim to preserve and pass his Russian culture to his uh, children and uh, without hesitation uh, would say, I have read an Australian family. I lived 30 years happy under Australian rule. And if the time comes, I and my sons will defend this soil from invasion. And so they did during the Second World War. But in a way, it was his Russian identity that gave the impetus uh, to Leandra's descendants' involvement in indigenous activism, fighting for the dignity, liberty, and identity of their kin. And I watch it daily because half of this family now are friends, my friends on Facebook. Uh, my uh, discovery and study of the Russian Anzacs, about a thousand natives of the Russian Empire who enlisted in the Australian army in the First World War, allowed me to see how the Anzac legend, uh, the cornerstones of which are mateship, egalitarianism, and uh, to use the uh, Aussie expression, a fair din Congo, works with the other, the people uh, of other ethnic origin. The story of a Ukrainian serviceman, uh, Theophil Volkovsky, a former teacher and political immigrant, is telling in this respect. After the war, he... Um, married an Australian woman and became an outback farmer. Theophil's son Thomas told me that that would not teach us Russian. He said that Russian would never be any good to you. You don't want to know it. He said, uh, you are Australians, you be Australians. He was very definite this way. This might look like a total assimilation, but like Leandro Volkovsky wrote numerous letters to the editor in the local newspapers, about which Tom told me. Dad would always write in the paper about things like kangaroo problems, always writing to a minister for this and to a minister for that. He started an organization called the Western Settlers Association. He fought very hard to get a high school at Kabar, and he succeeded in getting that, and he fought for a school hostel for the kids from the land, uh, so that kids from the land could stay at the hostel. Uh, that succeeded too. At the same time, in Tasmania, another Anzac, the Belarusian Simon Suchkov uh, advoca advocated uh, in his letters to, uh, for grassroots farmers' rights, local roads, and boarding school for kids. All this might seem quintessentially Australian problems, but where are they? To the Russian eye, it is obvious that these are the actions of a classical pre-revolutionary democrat Narodnik, who finds himself laboring in the countryside among the underdogs and fights for their rights. I had uh, the long uh, echoes of these struggles when I recently contacted farmers in Idis Creek, Tasmania, in hopes of finding out something about Simon Suchkov, who had no family and died there over 60 years ago. Uh, 
To my surprise, I discovered that his neighbors still remember and cherish him, preserving his papers, medals, and his pipe. He obviously fell out of the typical institutionalized uh, diaspora with its schools, churches, clubs, but by no means did he stop being Russian or rather Belarusian. Among the country roads, one of which is known as Suchkov Road, beneath high, uh, high eucalypts, he erected a different kind of temple in the memories and souls of people who, thanks to their Belarusian neighbor, grew up without xenophobia. And all this was achieved not through institution, institutions which sought to promote as uh, an a priori positive image of Russia, but through a rural neighborhood with a single good Belarusian. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it is obvious that among all my heroes from the pre-revolutionary immigration, we will not find many traces of stereotypical Russianness such as preservation of language, religion, and traditional cuisine. But at the same time, the identity of these people goes beyond the negative image of a ruthless assimilant. Russia and their Russian pasts undoubtedly played an important role in the lives of these people. This apparent contradiction can be explained by the fact that Russian heritage preserved by the people of this cohort is not limited to a narrow ethnic diaspora group, no confined to a folk or pseudo-folk culture. On the contrary, it is anthropic, mingling easily with the surrounding society and accepting universal humanist ideas as its own. I want to thank uh, Ilyana for a remarkable uh, a presentation on the contribution of immigrants from our part of the world to the Australian democracy. And now our next speaker will continue the historical topic. And I'm introducing Andrea Chalupa, whose Ukrainian parents were born in displaced persons camps in post-World War II Europe. She is the author of Orwell and the Refugees, the untold story of Animal Farm that was featured on NPR, Public Radio International and the BBC. She is a screenwriter, a founder of Digital Maidan, uh, she graduated from University of California at Davis in history and after that worked as community organizer in the 2004 presidential election. Lived in Kiev, published her work on Huffington Post. And by the way, Andrea is the only one of us with an accent. That's the American accent. And you surely will enjoy listening to her. And uh, now I'm passing the floor to Andrea, please. Thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to be here with this distinguished group of people. Thank you so much, Dimitri, for all the work you do and the, and the important insights that you share. I think my humble contribution to this uh, important discussion is um, I spent many years writing and producing a journalistic thriller, a dramatic film, not a documentary, but a sexy action adventure film called Mr. Jones, which was directed by the three-time Academy Award nominee Agnieszka Holland, who is a Polish filmmaker born and raised in Soviet-occupied Poland. She produced several films, including Europa Europa. She directed The Secret Garden. She's directed a lot of television like The Wire, The Affair, Rosemary's Baby. And uh, the film, Mr. Jones, that Agnieszka Holland and I made together is the story of the little known independent Welsh journalist, Gareth Jones, who risked his life to expose Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine and how the truth was buried, how we had to battle not just the Kremlin and Soviet propaganda, but also powerful Western journalists who were in the pocket of Soviet propaganda and Western governments like the British government and the US government that were happy to open relations with the Soviet government if it meant doing business together and profiting together somehow. So it's an incredible real life story. Um, it, it was many years of research. And um, 
most famously recently, it was Mr. Jones was the film that Memorial in Moscow hosted a screening of the evening that they were shut down by a group of thugs who came in and disrupted the screen screening, chanting all sorts of nonsense like fascists and whatever. And when the organizers of Memorial called the cops, called the authorities for help, the authorities, of course, targeted them for showing this film, Mr. Jones, and for their important brave work generally. And as we all know from all the reports that came out, uh, the audience and the organizers were held captive for many hours inside Memorial uh, until 2 a.m. Um, and unfortunately, since then, there's been um, horrific threats to Memorial that, that are ongoing. And as we all know, Memorial does critical, important work. And so this is obviously a tragedy for uh, not just uh, people across Russia, but the truth. Um, so that's, that's my story. I, I wrote and produced Mr. Jones inspired by my grandfather, who was the world to me growing up uh, in an Im Ukrainian immigrant family in California. My grandfather was born and raised in Donbass. He experienced uh, life in Ukraine under Stalin. He was a little boy watching the Russian Revolution being fought on his farm between barefoot, tattered Bolshevik soldiers and, and the Tsar's army. He um, survived Stalin's genocide famine as a young man, and then he was arrested and tortured as a young father during Stalin's purges. And uh, so his whole uh, life story, he wrote down shortly before he passed away, and he left me that manuscript, and I took it to Ukraine and had it translated from Ukrainian into English, and a lot of that research went into the making of the film Mr. Jones. And the reason why I highlight Mr. Jones, not only because of, of course, the connection to Memorial in Russia, but also the film, which has an extraordinary cast of names that you would likely recognize. There's Vanessa Kirby, who was um, Princess Margaret on the crown. There was James Norton, who uh, is rumored to be a contender to play James Bond. There's Peter Sarsgaard, who's in the next Batman film. So the cast was an international extraordinary cast and the director of course with multi multiple Oscar nominations and I emphasize I that, that. I want to emphasize that point to say this film was made not by a Hollywood agent Hollywood wanted nothing to do with me this film was made because of Ukrainian diaspora organizations and communities across the U.S. and in Canada and in Europe and I think sharing a bit of that story very quickly is, might be instructive to any diaspora organizers anywhere who want to learn how to create their own media and build that media to reach a mainstream audience. Because I think that's extraordinarily important. Uh, Dimitri emphasized in his introduction a lot of the uh, political outreach, meeting with the White House, meeting with Congress and how crucial that is. One very big point of contact that diaspora groups can have is through media, through the arts. Uh, for instance, we're currently working on organizing a screening of Mr. Jones in Congress. And of course, we're going to have um, um, outreach to the White House to do a screening. And so I think uh, for diaspora groups, it's so important to hold events, promoting your artists, uh, promoting your films, creative films, promoting the arts. Um, giving voice to all the brave people that were silenced by a, a Soviet repression over the years, holding art exhibits around or readings, poetry readings, whatever they produced during their, their difficult lifetimes and giving new life, giving new voice to that artwork, to that culture and bringing it back. Um, I have in the Ukrainian diaspora, we of course, every November come together globally uh, as a global diaspora community to honor the many millions of victims of Stalin in, in the month of November for the Hodomor, Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine. And just the fact that we know every November, the global Ukrainian families coming together, it's November, November's coming, that annual event that, that we're all anchored in as a community, that has a lot of power in creating all types of ideas and community connections and events that's been a launching pad year after year so every year when I was struggling to get Mr. Jones made I knew that I would see the Ukrainian diaspora all the leaders all the 
community, all the funders, all the local credit unions. I would see all the big um, organ organizations that November, and we could plan events together to get the, to build awareness of, of the of the famine. Uh, and in doing that work together year after year, I was able to build the relationships needed to fund the film Mr. Jones independently, to be introduced to Agnieszka Holland, who you know I went direct I, because of my work in the Ukrainian diaspora, I was able to be directly introduced to Agnieszka Holland. I didn't have to go through her agent, and it was by pulling together this finan these financial resources at, from, the di from the Ukrainian diaspora community, pulling together these important relationships, we were able to, as a di diaspora community, produce Mr. Jones, a film that Hollywood did not want to touch. It's not a Marvel movie. There are no, you know, there, there are real life superheroes in the film, brave people that risk their lives and career for the truth, but it's not, it's not a Hollywood film. And so I just want to emphasize that, um, that the power of, of, of diaspora communities to do work that penetrates, that makes it into the mainstream in a, in a big way. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize is that my journey in, in, in getting to know the, the diaspora communities worldwide began by self-publishing a book called Orwell and the Refugees, The Untold Story of Animal Farm. That has a, that book has a lot of the research that went into Mr. Jones. I was struggling for many years to get the film made. And so I decided enough already, I need to put some of the research out there. And so I made what is known as an Amazon Kindle. I hired a friend who's a brilliant local artist here in New York to do the cover. I had the smartest people I could in my network read it as editors and I made it myself and I put that book online. And as soon as I did that, I was invited to speak uh, by all these Ukrainian diaspora groups. And that led to press coverage in the Ukrainian diaspora. And that led to more invitations around the world. And that is how Mr. Jones got made. So I want to encourage people to make your own art, create your own media, and just put it out there. Um, build it through the resources you have around you and just get your voice out there as much as you can and, and, and dream big and think big and know that over time you can put together some great work of art or some interesting media that will get the story of your community out there to a broader audience. And I think that work has never been more critical um, for for groups struggling against autocracy worldwide. Um, before we move to the, our current uh, uh, part about uh, today's event, I want also to praise Andrea for being with us when we organized uh, the joint Russian-Ukrainian diaspora events against Putin's invasion in Ukraine in 2014-2015 and the big uh, rally in memory of Boris Nemtsov three days after he was killed. That was in New York City, the rally. Dimitri, do you mind? Do you, do you mind if I just share very, very, very quickly? It was your work in organizing that rally that helped save my project. Oh. I was I, in 2015. I was ready to give up on Mr. Jones because no one wanted my script. I was all alone after all these years, and you reached out to me and invited me to this solidarity event. Ukrainians, Russians, everyone gathering together in New York with Nemtsov's movement across Russia. And I was so thrilled to be a part of that. And then, of course, what happened was he was murdered and it turned into this heartbreaking vigil for, to honor his life and to stand up against Putin. But it was that anger I had inside of me about, what, about the death of Nemtsov, the murder of Nemtsov, that forced me to keep going. And I wrote nearly an all new draft of Mr. Jones, an angry draft that grabbed the reader by the throat and said, how dare you not care about what's going on right now? And th it's that angry draft that I sent to Agnieszka Holland. And she was just as angry as I was. And that's how the whole project took off. So you played in a, a very important part in helping me keep going at a time that I very much wanted to quit because I was depressed. And so I want to thank you for that. Thank you. That's great to hear. It might be a topic of another round table uh, separate <laughs> from today. Uh, now I want to give the floor to one of the co-chairs of the board of directors of our association and a very distinguished uh, participant of human rights movement for a number of decades. She was uh, uh, the director of uh, the Sakharov program at Harvard and of course is a 
uh, daughter-in-law of Andrei Sakharov, Tatiana Yankilevich. Uh, hey, thank you very much, Dmitry, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, everyone, uh, for turning up for this, I think, uh, quite uh, an important uh, uh, get together to discuss how we can uh, move on and help uh, <clears throat> help uh, the democratic forces in the country that we live and in the country that we have come from. And I want to take a moment to to thank Andrea for her very interesting uh, uh, presentation and for the film, which I have seen. And I was going to mention uh, the situation with Memorial and especially uh, what happened just prior to the charges pressed by the prosecutor's office. And uh, I was impressed by the film. And I think that it is uh, artistically a very good achievement. Uh, of course, uh, not in the least, thanks to a good script and a great, uh, um, a director, Agnieszka Holland. So thank you so much, Andrea. It, it was a really a memorable experience to see the film, especially against the backdrop of what's going on with Memorial. Uh, I, uh, uh, I want to remind uh, everyone that Sakharov stood behind uh, the founding of Memorial, even though it was not um, it was not uh, registered as a legitimate um, uh, non-governmental or non uh, um, uh, in, uh, as we call it in Russian, uh, uh, organization. And it was only after Sakharov died uh, that uh, about four days later, when Gorbachev uh, asked the kind of proverbial uh, magnanimous question, uh, of the widow, what can I do for you? Uh, and usually it's something petty or uh, not, I don't want to self, uh, say self-serving, but usually uh, what is asked is some sort of improvement of one situation. Like a poor widow would ask the magnanimous uh, ruler uh, to, to help her improve her situation. And my mother at that time said, register Memorial. And just days after that, Memorial was registered as a legitimate uh, non-governmental uh, public organization in Russia. And that was a very, very important moment in the history of uh, modern human rights movement. And uh, the, uh, what Memorial is doing uh, cannot be even described by one uh, sentence. Uh, but to me, the most important uh, thing uh, that is absolutely crucial to the development or to any hope for the democratic Russia uh, is pre preserving historical truth. And actually, I went, I just went quite uh, over quite a few quotes uh, from Sakharov when I was getting ready for today's meeting. And I came across something that I haven't read before, that he said uh, that at some point he thought that the bomb, the thermonuclear bomb that he uh, was one of the major um, contributors to that project um, was absolutely essential. And I think that he was right. And he actually stood by this for the rest of his life, just for your information, that his human rights uh, activity was not a kind of token of repentance. Uh, he felt that uh, the um, uh, strategic parity was absolutely essential for the world not to slip into a thermonuclear uh, disaster and uh, um, uh, self-annihilation. So he thought that the bomb was important, but then he realized that not the bomb, but the truth is more important. So that's what Memorial is doing now. It's preserving the truth about our past. And if we do not face that past as it was in its true form, we will not be able to, to overcome it, to process it in our mind and to uh, proceed on a solid foundation 
of understanding of our past to the future. That is absolutely essential. And I think that actually uh, the film that Andre was talking about is part of that preservation of, of historical truth and of where we come from. And that uh, is our um, asset that we can, uh, and that helps us to uh, contribute constructively to the protection of democracy and human rights in whatever country we find ourselves in. And I have been in this country uh, for over 40 years now. And I can see to my great dismay that human rights are not as much on the agenda anymore uh, uh, as they were in the uh, 1980s, for example. The, um, uh, the understanding of these issues becomes more and more vague, more and more kind of diluted, and uh, the, the, the contours of what is right and what is wrong are not as easy to perceive as it used to be in the time when I just came to this country and in the time of Sakharov's internal exile uh, with all the cruelty that was he was subjected to. And we, of course, Sakharov was not a, uh, let's say, a man in the street or a uh, unknown, not famous dissident. Uh, but uh, bringing the, the um, uh, the situation of Sakharov to the fore helped us uh, also protect, if indirectly, sometimes directly, helped us protect the victims of injustice in Russia and to protect the human rights activists wherever they may have been at that time, either persecuted non-judicially or, uh, 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 or subjected to cruel treatment in the camps and prisons. So uh, we, uh, we do not have an easy task in front of us. And these times are much harder than those that uh, I have witnessed in the 1980s and in the 1990s. Uh, we, we have a very uh, uh, determined regimes in, in my home country, in my motherland of Russia, to crush any independent uh, uh, activity, be it an organization or a group or an individual even now. And we have to find a way to bring the attention of uh, our legislators. We have to be really uh, aggressive, thoughtful, determined, and we cannot afford the luxury of kind of resting. And that would be uh, in the year of Sakharov's centenary, that would be the best tribute to his memory. And I want to, to say, uh, to quote from what he wrote in 1975, just before he was awarded the Nobel Prize, his uh, Nobel Peace Prize, he was, uh, he, uh, as a book by him, a brochure, came out in the West. It was called uh, My Country and the World. And in this brochure he wrote, the reality of the modern world is very complex, multifaceted. Tragedy, hopelessness, apathy, prejudice, ignorance, and dynamism, selflessness, hope, reason, are bizarrely mixed in it. The future could be even more tragic. It can be more worthy of a person, kinder and more reasonable, but it also may not be there at all. It all depends on all of us. And I think that unfortunately, like many of the concerns that Sakharov brought to the fore when he was alive, uh, uh, they are still relevant today, sadly. Uh, and what I've just quoted uh, is unfortunately still very true. And it does depend on all of us. So uh, I, I really uh, wish uh, uh, the company that I see here all the best in uh, trying to uh, jointly 
in collaboration and in solidarity with the victims of injustice, wherever they may be. Uh, I uh, uh, wish uh, you all uh, uh, a good working meeting, at which point I will have to apologize and say goodbye. But I very much look forward to being in touch with uh, you either through Dmitry or individually with anyone who, um, who wants to reach out to me with uh, any sort of question or discussion. I would be happy to be of help and I will continue to closely monitor everything that our association does and I will um, contribute when I can, hopefully in a more constructive manner. Thank you so, so much, everyone. Thank you, Tatiana, for your very constructive participation and for being with us here today. And uh, as a follow-up and um, transition to the next, I want to say that uh, this year, while studying a little bit of Sakharov, I learned two things. First, that uh, the Nimtich was uh, in dialogue with uh, political uh, emigration, with those who were forced out of Soviet Union, uh, even though uh, some in the distant movement thought that uh, they were cut off and that uh, basically all the struggle was going inside the country. In fact, Sakharov at one point said that he doesn't rule out immigration for himself. So uh, it was not uh, something uh, that is, was totally separate from him, his work inside the country. And second, of course, he cared about uh, uh, human rights uh, in entire former Soviet Union and in the world, which is why he campaigned for global political amnesty. And in that spirit, we are moving to a country that is, uh, of course, separate, but is very important to all of us in Russia, in Ukraine, and in other parts of the world. We have with us Nadia Zinikova, who is a co-owner of digital agency in Belarus, uh, was a partner in Y Gallery of Contemporary Arts there, is a democratic activist but is currently forced to live abroad in Estonia and she is also the wife of political prisoner of the Lukashenko regime, Alexander Vasilevich, who is uh, on the uh, uh, Vyasna list of political prisoners in the last row. Nadia, please, your floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Thank you very much for introduction and thank you for inviting me here. Uh, unfortunately, I have no theoretical knowledge about political immigration, uh, but I do have practical one. And I like to share my story and the stories of my friend from Belarus. Uh, in my country, there has been only one non-rigid uh, presidential election. It was in 1994. At the time, I helped to make, make copies of the election campaign film about Zinon Patniak. Uh, Zinon didn't win the election, and after two years, knowing that he was in danger, he left Belarus and received political asylum in the United States. Uh, coming back to 1994, Alexander Lukashenko won the election, and since then he started to build Belarus, where there has been less and less freedom. Uh, Maxim Znak is a lawyer and political prisoner, already uh, since, uh, sentenced to 10 years in prison. Uh, he began to use the new term, legal default. Here is what he wrote from prison. Legal default is not individual violation, but the state of the system as a whole. When applying it, you cannot violate the law a little. Vicious practices will spread to different areas because they are more convenient. But as history shows, eventually the circle closes and the vicious practices return to those who use it. As for the question how to live, injustice is one of the challenges we have to fight. Some people say, however, say that uh, we should accept injustice, but I think this is a bad strategy. For 27 years, uh, my country has lived in a situation where the law doesn't exist for everyone. If you are running for the presidency, you must be ready to go to jail. Waves of immigration most often coincided with election campaigns and it aftermath. Before the last election, my uh, friends used to joke that they measure the indicator of the internal victory meter every day. This device where an arrow indicates victory on one side or immigration 
on the other. Uh, since August 2002, uh, already for 15 months, uh, Alexander Vasilevich, my husband, uh, has been in prison. He's also a political prisoner and uh, I spent 10 hours under uh, interrogation and became a suspect in a criminal case. And after leaving uh, the interrogation, I found out that my husband would not get out of there and that so many people's homes and offices has been searched, including mine and my parents' apartment, our gallery of contemporary art, my agency office. Uh, after two months, I was able to leave Belarus, and since then, I lived in Estonia. Here, I gave uh, birth to our second daughter. She's uh, one year old now, and a date for her is just a photograph on the wall. People face a conscious choice between immigration and prison. The fearless ones have chosen prison. Maria Kalesnikova is the leader of Victor, uh, Victor's Babarika team and Svetlana Tikhanovska joint team. She torn up her passport and uh, chewed its pages at the border with Ukraine to avoid being forced from the country. Maria has already been sentenced uh, to 11 years in prison. Alice Bilatsky, a founder of a human rights organization, SNAP, uh, was nominated five times for the Nobel Peace Prize. He knew the dangers, nevertheless, he remained in Belarus. He and almost all his team are in prison now. Editor, lawyers, musicians, cultural managers, prison really packed uh, with highly intelligent individuals. There are many people who choose, have chosen immigration. And uh, I'm personally very grateful for them for this choice because they can continue to influence the situation. They do so through unimaginable personal challenges. Svetlana Tikhanovska is a leader for whom the Belarusians gave their votes first and then their hearts, talks about Belarus at her meetings with the Western leaders knowing that her husband is going through a closed court, which will issue a ridiculous sentences in actually in two weeks. Svetlana and uh, the immigrated Belarusians create working structures that continue to fight for the right of Belarusians and are preparing reform, creating a system that can be transferred to Belarus after. Um, by the way, we already have a government in exile and it is the oldest in exile in the world. Uh, the RADA, uh, this World Mean um, Council in Belarusian. Uh, so the RADA of the Belarusian People's Republic declared uh, Belarus as an independent state in 1918. Uh, the RADA has been in exile since 1919. And Belarus remains the only country in Eastern Europe who have is its government in exile. As the Rada says that it will support Svetlana Tikhanovska as long as their value are the same, and that they are for now by 100%. Answering the question about the role of immigration, I would like to quote a Belarusian writer, Vasil Bikov. He told, uh, said that uh, the Belarusian diaspora had become uh, part of the democratic world and it's free from many of the shortcomings which the citizens of the recent totalitarian states are inherited. The historical role of the Belarusian diaspora is that it was the first who, um, to rise from its knees. The diaspora preserved essential elements of the national culture kept her native language pure and remained faithful to the idea of national revival. We do not know the exact numbers, but today's wave of, of migration includes at least 300,000 um, people. Uh, these people became the voice of Belarus um, because to raise the voice in Belarus is equal to going to jail. Freedom of speech does not exist. Uh, 30 journalists are behind bars. 
My husband um, is a co-founder of the media outlets Kuku.org and The Village Me. Uh, last year, the Ministry of Information blocked both outlets and the editors are abroad now. And this is how Sasha Romanova, the editor of the, this online publishing house, describes political immigration. You are not an economical refugee who sold uh, an apartment, a calculate life in a new place for a year ahead. You are a political one who abandoned everything as it is, put the cat in good hands and sailed off into the unknown with one suitcase. The motive is simple, not to communicate with the KGB, not to sit in a dumb cell, not to be afraid of a knock on the, on the door, not to let your children carry your parcels to prison. We are all not ready to call our situation immigration. It seems that tomorrow it will be possible to come back home with experience, emotion and knowledge of how to build a new and ideal Belarus. In my opinion, this involvement in the life of another country is perhaps the second massive advantage after the feeling of security. People who live in free countries while returning bring what many residents of totalitarian country do not have the confidence that there should be zero tolerance to violence against human rights. This also works in an opposite direction. Exile from totalitarian countries has the ability to recognize the site of non-democratic action in their new home countries. They can be the first who light the signal fires. Today, Belarusians are grateful to the world for the support and recognition of the officers and teams of the democratic forces. Receiving accusation of betrayal and new criminal cases from their homeland, political immigrants understand that now they are the ones of the few voices that can be heard. And they keep talking. And believe me, it is also required inner power because most often they want to scream out of the powerlessness to help their family and friends get out of prison, help all Belarusians escape from their prison. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Nadia, with your very thought-provoking and I would say powerful words. And now we are moving to our fourth and final speaker in our main part and probably the most well-known among us, Evgenia Chirikova is one I would say one of the leaders of the latest wave of democratic movement in Russia that was crushed by Mr. Putin in 2012. She is the founder of Activatica.org, a site that promotes activism in Russia. She is the winner of the Woman of Courage Award that was presented to her by then Vice President uh, Biden at the US Embassy in Moscow 10 years ago. She also won the Goldman Environmental Prize. In 2012, she ran for mayor of the city of Himki, which is a suburb of Moscow, with support of many groups, the Yabloka Party and many others. And she won 18% in that race, according to the official data. We never know how much it was in reality. Uh, so uh, also, I want to add that uh, I'm very pleased that Evgenia is also a member of our human rights working group that was created under the State Department. Thank you a lot for the invitation uh, for so interesting event. And uh, today I would like to share some of the trends that exist in civil society now in Russia. First of them, pressure from the authorities uh, on activists has increased significantly. Second, the cost of protests in Russia increased. In accordance with the constitution, citizens of Russia have the right to demonstrate. But in reality, such peaceful demonstrations end up for activists at least with the high fines. Over the past 10 years, the amount of fines for activists uh, has increased tenfold. If activists continue to go out to peaceful demonstration, they are imprisoned under a new anti-constitutional uh, law. 
despite the high cost of protest, people in Russia continue to fight for their rights. Every day on the social portal activatica.org, our team publishes new about, news about civil activity throughout Russia. Where citizens manage to organize a systematic and massive protest, they manage to win. It's possible in Putin's Russia. The most significant victories of civil society in Russia in recent years are the victory of Shias against the landfill in the Arkhangelsk district and the victories in Bashkortostan, where activists defended the unique nature territory of mountain Kushtao and other protected areas. A uh, fresh example uh, is a uh, uh, Talpak Lake and activists from Bashkirtistan to save this unique nature territory, Talpak Lake. The authorities take revenge on citizens uh, for their victories. For example, an activist from Shiz, Barovikov, was imprisoned for two years for simple reposting on Vkontakte a clip of Rammstein rock band. And the uh, Bashkort organization from Bashkirtistan, which achieved victory in Kushtau, was recognized by authorities as extremists. The Putin authorities are closing down effective and beautiful NGOs. I remind you situation with memorial now. New disgusting trend in Russia. The authorities discredit, discredit activism in Russia. For example, uh, they allow Stalinists to hold rallies on important social topics while banning any other attempts to care out public events on such issues. For a normal person, of course, it is important to support on important social them, but few people want to stand next to portraits of Stalin. The authorities have organized campaigns against activists from the structure of Alexei Navalny and Mikhail Khodorkovsky. They have fabricated criminal cases against them. They are imprisoned now. It is important that civil activism in Russia continues. Even if the activists leave Russia, many of them continue their activities. Our task is to actively support activists in Russia to provide them with the necessary services. Media support, legal support, psychological support, assisting with anti-corruption uh, investigation. Why is this so important? This is important because they resist Putin's most strong system with no experience or resource. We are also obligated to help activists in danger to evacuate from Russia to help with integration in new places. Our new priority is to preserve the life and health of activists and help activists both inside Russia and outside Russia. This is important because it is the grassroots activists who only will be able to organize on the future and normal democratic Russia after collapse of the Putin regime. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Zhenya, excellent presentation. And uh, we'll move to the question and answers part. But before that, I would like to mention a couple of uh, our guests that unfortunately for technical reasons, some of them are not uh, were with us, uh, but uh, left and uh, hopefully will come back. 
The one who was here with us is a former member of Ukrainian parliament, Lyubov Stasiv, uh, who actually had a, a little presentation prepared. So maybe she will join us. Besides being member of the Ukrainian parliament, she was also the chief of humanitarian and cultural heritage office at the secretariat of Ukraine's president, Viktor Yushchenko, and chaired the private enterprise support foundation in Ukraine. I also saw uh, here uh, are my colleague uh, in the association, co-chair of the board of directors, Pavel Solenzinga, who uh, also heads an international foundation for uh, the development of uh, indigenous people, uh, indigenous peoples, and was also a candidate for uh, Russian parliament on uh, the Yabloka list, the uh, last uh, active democratic party, uh, currently uh, still present there. Uh, I also uh, saw Andrei, Andrei Grigorenko, who is the president of uh, the Petro Grigorenko Foundation, but I think he also left by now. Uh, now, uh, as the first question that I would like, I actually want to invite everyone who is here to post their questions in the chat. Um, uh, if uh, we have any uh, time left for very brief, maybe two minute um, uh, questions from the audience, we'll do that. But for now, please post them in the chat. And uh, uh, since we are doing this in context of the summit, I would like to ask uh, about the summit. So as uh, the, um, the the announcement says uh, the summit will set an agenda for democratic renewal around the world and will galvanize commitments and initiatives across three principal themes, defending against authoritarianism, fighting corruption, and promoting respect for human rights. And I think most importantly, leaders will be encouraged to announce specific actions and commitments to meaningful internal reforms and international initiatives. So from your perspective, from your experience, what do you think uh, either your country where you live now, or uh, more generally, what commitments, what uh, do you think the uh, participants in the summit should undertake domestically, internationally, that would influence um, uh, the uh, situation with human rights and democracy worldwide, in our countries, in our part of the world? Uh, uh, I have only one answer, and uh, it's answer of uh, environmentalist answer, uh, because I think that our main problem is that uh, Europe uh, continue to collaborate with Putin's regime and continue to buy from Putin gas, oil, and other natural resources. It's a huge problem, and at this moment, I think it's extremely important to stop Nord Stream 2 project. Why it's important? Because Putin regime, unfortunately, to use this money from Europe for disgusting needs, for propaganda machine, for military campaign against our neighbors, against Ukraine, against Georgia. And I think it's really very bad uh, for uh, human rights on Russia. We, uh, Europe continue to pay for Putin's regime. Putin's regime continue uh, to pay for Silviki, uh, for police, uh, for FSB, and they continue to press of civil society. And I think it's a, a very strong connection between oil and gas from Putin's Russia and between human rights on Russia. I think it's very important to stop collaborate with Putin's Russia. And I kindly ask uh, uh, Congress of USA and State Department to organize strong san sanction against the Nord Stream 2 project. And I think it's disgusting that Germany to support this project. It's really shame. Okay, thank you for that uh, response. I want to agree to Kristina Talalayevska, who wrote to us in chat that she is representing Ukrainian NGO I Democracy that promotes human rights in Ukraine and concentrates on human trafficking. Thank you so much for, for all your um, powerful comments and your work. And so my question was, uh, here in the US, we've been watching the Biden administration hold a summit with Putin decline to sanction Nord Stream 2, and it's been pretty horrifying to watch. Uh, what pressure could Americans and communities here in the U.S. put on Biden, his administration specifically, his whole team, in terms of 
demanding greater support for Russian civil society. What support, if any, have they given you and what support would you like specifically from the Biden administration? Uh, I, uh, thank you a lot for, for this great question. And I think that we need uh, uh, to ask uh, Biden administration uh, to demand from Putin's, uh, uh, from, uh, Putin's authorities to release Alexei Navalny immediately. And uh, well, I think that we, uh, we need uh, uh, to ask Biden um, to, to demand from Putin to stop uh, uh, pressure to uh, memorial immediately too. And uh, if, we are, uh, uh, if we speak about support of Russian civil society, I think that at this moment, it's extremely important to continue to support independent NGOs from Russia, because a lot of NGOs, independent NGOs, uh, were forced to move to Europe, to America, and continue their activity uh, out of Russia. And uh, they continue to organize services for grassroots groups, and it's extremely important uh, to support them. And well, at this moment, I, I think that we need to organize support for uh, activists uh, from Navalny structures. Why it's so important? Because at this moment, uh, Putin's regime to organize a uh, great and uh, disgusting campaign against these activists and dozens of uh, activists from Navalny structures became on prison. And it's a really very, very dangerous for them. And uh, I think that we need to help them to evacuate from Russia. And, and it's so simple uh, to buy tickets uh, for them, but it's so difficult for these uh, simple people from Navalny structure to buy uh, a ticket from Russia to Europe. It's really a very uh, high cost price for them. They don't have money. And I think that it's really a good idea to organize a special foundation and help for activists from Navalny structure to evacuate from Russia and uh, help uh, them on uh, new places. Because I, uh, I'm sure that these activists continue uh, uh, their activity uh, on Europe, on USA, and our uh, mission now, I think to help for people from Navalny structure, I think it's extremely important because Navalny organized a huge job during many years and we need to keep this uh, passion. We need to keep this activist. It was, uh, it's really extremely important to keep life and health of activists. Thank you. Uh Thank you. And I think also uh, maybe uh, later uh, Nadia would like to address this question in regard to Belarus. Uh, I also think I have uh, Lyubov Stasiv with us. I see her on the video. And uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, maybe she would like to mm, uh, say a couple of words. Again, Lyubov Stasiv is a former member of Ukrainian parliament. and. Uh, uh, of uh, Ukrainian government that dealt a lot with uh, Ukrainian diaspora, political exiles, and have, has a lot of experience to share. Uh, good morning, dear colleague. My English is not so good, but I am so glad to, um, to, to uh, for, for your invitation to take part in this interesting, but more importantly, very topical discussion. But um, any means possible, we must prevent an advance of Autor autocracy in uh, countries with young democracy, where um, unbridled, uh, unbridled uh, autor autoritarianism leads to war and uh, collapse about which I know um, firsthand. The role of the, the diaspora in the history of our native land is um, imaginable, but unfortunately not adverse to an um, average person. 20 years I have been an active uh, participant in the Ukrainian political life and numerous times have had a skeptical and sometimes cynical statements about the influence of the diaspora 
on the life of the country. For example, do not teach me how to live, just help me financially. As life has proven, this um, did not help in order to rule a democratic, uh, democratic society and to live in it, we have yet much to learn. Out of five Ukrainian immigration waves, two were political after the uh, First and Second um, World War. It, it is important to underline that it was these waves uh, that were the mo moving factory in solving um, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainians' political problems. Being highly educated uh, immigrant, then were lobbying for them interest of Ukraine um, on, on the governmental level. It was them who prepared the soil for Ukrainians independent, um, uh, criticized of the uh, Soviet Union for uh, violating human rights, participated in loud, uh, loud and silent um, protest and ter turned the attention of the United States uh, to the problem to the problems of Ukraine. And for example, on uh, January 21st of 1917, both uh, House of Congress adopted a resolution about collecting uh, funds to help Ukrainians who who have suffered from the war in Austria. In the beginning of the 1980 election com uh, campaign took place in Washington, honoring. Uh, 50th anniversary since the Ukrainian Holodomor tragedy. A commission of the United States Congress was established to study this issue. The commission recognized um, Holodomor as a ge genocide and uh, um, laid blame of the Soviet leadership. Um, this had direct influence and helped with arguments to support Ukrainians in their right of the self-determination. The Ukrainian diaspora initiated the personal intervention of President Reagan in the release of Lukko Lukyanenko and Yuri Shukhevich in 1988, this person a long-term political prisoner. The size of uh, the Ukrainian the diaspora is about one million. Almost a hundred years have uh, passed since the founding of the first public organization. Today, uh, they have almost 60 of, of them. They are different. Some um, of them are more active in political life, scientists, education, as in the cultural, religion, and or financial. financial. They have um, unconditional unity in one sense, helping their homeland, where the war is still going on strong after seven years. And almost uh, 14,000 um, 14, Ukrainian soldiers and uh, volunteers who have died at the front of the Ukrainian uh, youth in the U USA that created a volunteering organization that in the cooperation with veteran organization uh, bring the uh, one, one wanted uh, the treatment and uh, rehabilitation. This organization also helped the family of soldiers killed in war. They continue to lobby for the government bills uh, that uh, will uh, help end the war. And thank you for your thank you, for the thank news. you, Luba, for being with us. Now, one very brief uh, you know, comment uh, will be from Vienna, and then we'll, I'll, I'll ask Nadia to say a couple of words in response to questions in the chat, and then we'll conclude. Uh, so I I'm have uh, one of my colleagues, Yekaterina Borodetska, who is uh, co-organizer of our uh, Russian Diaspora Council for the End for Political Reprisals in Russia, Paul Vupuskai. She is based in Vienna. She will say us a couple of words from there. Um, so uh, first of all, also thank you very much for um, these very interesting presentations and uh, for this uh, exchange. Um, yeah, it was very interesting listening to very different uh, views of how we can uh, achieve more uh, democracy in uh, both uh, after Soviet uh, countries or and uh, also in Russia. So, um, well, my personal uh, 
notice uh, would be that um, I, w I was uh, in Czech, in Prague, and it was in October. And uh, I've just noticed that uh, a lot of uh, people also and um, in, uh, so from Russia or those who were um, coming from also from Belarus, uh, so from uh, people who were uh, confronted with violence with, for, uh, from the uh, authoritarian regimes, um, that um, uh, some of them were very in a depression, you know, so, and so it was very important that there was like um, a meeting point for, or like, you know, uh, some like platform for those people uh, where they can exchange uh, with their different uh, views, with the different opinions where uh, there were politicians as well. Also, uh, these were politicians from Czech uh, government. Um, it was organized by Anton Litvin, uh, an artist uh, originally from Moscow. He lives in Prague for six years now. And so he um, uh, received also some grants and uh, created contacts also with uh, 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 Russian oppositions uh, like uh, Vladimir Milov and many others. And so uh, after that, you know, just I, when this meeting was finished, I've just noticed that I had so much joy and hope, you know, so that there will something uh, happen also in Russia. And I just uh, think that it, it powers uh, the civil society. So it is very important and uh, whatever we leave uh, that uh, uh, we just strengthen this uh, civil uh, kind of exchange and also um, create some platforms uh, where different uh, people can come together and also communicate with uh, um, politicians from our governments, you know, so because it's sometimes very difficult to find an empathy uh, also among other, uh, our Russian speaking diaspora, unfortunately, uh, there are very different reasons. Um, I don't want to analyze it why, but I think just it is very important also to um, uh, to emphasize the attention to the problems of uh, uh, what happens in Russia or what happens in Belarus also in the local society. And so uh, that they know that uh, just uh, being, being against, uh, being against uh, Lukashenko and whenever you are or whenever you live, it uh, confronts with uh, some threats and uh, that it is not like a fantasy and these countries are so close to Europe, you know, and that this money, what is here in Europe, we finance with this, these regimes, we finance that this money, Putin's money and Lukashenko money, it is actually the same. It's not that Putin is better and Lukashenko is worse. It's just the same. Their money are full in blood. And I think that if we could just uh, whatever we are, uh, we could strong this civil connection. Uh, uh, once we have Russian diaspora, maybe or Russian speaking, I'm sorry, yes, Russian speaking society, uh, democratic society in Australia, then we have it in Germany, then we have it in Vienna, and we are one of uh, the, uh, uh, what I uh, say, international movement, yes. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be. Um, very important if we could achieve it. And it would also uh, strengthen those voices uh, who are hoping and they are sitting in prison uh, and they know that their uh, voices are heard. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Katya, for joining us from Vienna. I also want to give a shout out to one other participant in our uh, event today, uh, who is a Bangladeshi American, a member of Bangladeshi diaspora. His name is Sheikh Rahman. He was corresponding with us in chat, as some of you saw. And in this connection, I want to remind that we are discussing today, of course, mostly the issues close to our heart in our part of the world. But in fact, these are global issues, and we uh, have the audience and uh, concerns of many other uh, countries and people struggling for their rights and democracy. And now I would like to go back to Nadia for a couple of minutes. So if she would like, if Nadia would like to say something about what she expects from the summit and also Yelena, 
uh, posted a question in chat for Nadia. Uh, Elena asks, do Belarusians feel somehow betrayed by the West now? So somewhere in between those two, uh, if you can say so. Yeah, uh, Dmitry Elena, thank you for the question. And I want to highlight that uh, what is happening right now in Belarus is a humanitarian catastrophe. And um, um, the number you can see like um, 887 person um, political prisoner, it's just a tip of the iceberg because um, um, nearly 5,000 uh, criminal cases opened related to this uh, the last elections. And actually uh, more than 37 uh, thousand people um, go through detention since uh, last August, uh, August 2010, uh, 2020. And um, also um, that the level of repression right now is awful and no one can, almost no one can feel safe um, in Belarus. And if we um, ignore, um, ignore um, do not put attention um, to these events. We raise a monster uh, and it will happen again and again. And of course, we feel a lot of uh, solidarity and a lot of support from uh, Europe and from America, uh, United States. Uh, but um, we have different feelings of time. I mean that I spoke to Svetlana Tikhanovskaya about work and about um, any decisions that can be made in uh, her team. And she told me that um, we have another feeling of um, time, of hour, of days, because every day for us, it's a day um, what our, um, that our uh, loved ones uh, spend in prison. And no one will ever help us to return those already for my husband. It's uh, 15 months, but uh, he's facing, um, I don't know how many years in prison, but from three to seven, for example. And um, so we do not have so many, so many times, so much time uh, we for discussing for some even um, uh, deciding what to uh, do with um, support, for example. And of course, we uh, feel that um, Western country uh, do a lot, um, but actually I think that this pressure is not enough right now. And we have to um, support uh, democratic forces um, and we have to pressure the regime and stop trading with, uh, with them, as Eugenia and Ekaterina said. So uh, answering the question whether we feel um, betrayed, uh, bet uh, that um, West, uh, Western country betrayed us? No, of course not. Uh, because it, it was our choice uh, to actually just to raise a voice. Uh, we, um, but right now, too many uh, people are in prison. And question of uh, fighting is not a question of just to be in prison. Uh, it's a question of life also, because if the other part are already... Uh, is ready to kill. Uh, you have to be ready um, to die if you want to raise your voice, not only go to jail. So I think that the uh, risks and the stocks are very high right now for my country. Thank you, Nadia, for these very important words. I just want to say very briefly that uh, uh, for us, for our uh, organization, all these years, what happens outside of Russia in other parts of the former Soviet Union, uh, that uh, uh, to which essentially uh, the empire uh, left uh, the systems that exist there right now is hugely important. And we, of course, don't have here, but we think also of people who are fighting for their rights and freedoms in 
countries of Central Asia in some other um, parts, certainly in the occupied uh, part of Ukraine. And I would like uh, now for the concluding words, uh, we are closing our event now. Uh, I want to ask one of the leaders of our organization, uh, Nina Rumyansova, who actually is from Ukraine and is American, is uh, one of our key organizers to say a few concluding words. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, hello. Mm. Uh, uh, I, I would like to thank uh, uh, the, all of the participants uh, on behalf of the, the, uh, the American Russian speaking uh, the Association of Civil and Human Rights. Uh, all of you uh, taking time uh, out of your this personal and your professional schedule means that the world for us, surely. Um, our next uh, uh, and uh, the next event uh, will be a round table uh, on the 10th anniversary of the International Table for Russia movement. It will take place on December 14th. Uh, I repeat, and uh, I would like to let you uh, make uh, in your calendar uh, the date, December 14th. Uh, this round table will be chaired by Andrew Grigorenko. Uh, we invite you all to join us. Uh, so thank you all again uh, and have a great day.